وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Today إن شاء الله تعالى We're going to speak about In this lecture today As it was announced 20 matters or 20 things that a student of knowledge finds distressful uh, when acquiring or trying to attain knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he created the human being and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he created the human being he created the human in the best form Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said in the Qur'an, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ أَمَا لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, we created the humans in the best form. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in another ayah, يَا أَيُّهَا الْإِنسَانُ O mankind, ما غرك بربك الكريم What has deceived you concerning Concerning your Lord بربك الكريم Your Lord the generous Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala الذي خلقك The one who created you فسواك And he فسواك It means he proportioned you Subhanahu wa ta'ala فعدلك And he balanced you في أي صورة ما شاء ركبك and in whichever form, the form that you're in, he is the one who brought your limbs together like that. So the human, as we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this ayah and the ayah before that I mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he created us in the best of forms. And from the great things of our creation is that our body has a leader, something that controls its affairs. And that is the heart. In the famous hadith in which Imam al-Bukhari narrated in his sahih, من حديث النعمان بن بشير رضي الله تعالى عنه النعمان بن بشير is a noble companion. The hadith is very long. But in the hadith, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, he said, ألا وإن في الجسد مضغة That verily, in the human being, there is a piece of meat إذا صلحت صلح الجسد كله that if this piece of meat this morsel if it's upright if it's steadfast the whole of the body is steadfast وإن فسدت and if this this small meat becomes corrupt then the rest of the body becomes corrupt the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said ألا وهي القلب this thing that controls the whole body, that the steadfastness of the body and the corruption of the body is connected to it is the heart. Lidalika Abu Huraira he took that statement of the Prophet والسلام, and he said Al Qalbu Malikul Aba that the heart is the king of the body. Wal Abdu and the body parts, your arms, your le- your hands, your legs, your face, your body parts are like its soldiers. The heart is the king. And the body parts are the soldiers. فَإِنْ طَابَ الْمَلِكَ And if the king is upright, he is noble, he is righteous. طَابَ جُنُودُهُ وَرَعَيَا And of course the soldiers and those who are under him are going to be upright. وَإِنْ خَبُثَ الْمَلِكَ If the king is corrupt and deviates, then his soldiers and those who are under him are going to become corrupt. So that the Quran when it says that 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he created us in the best of forms is the fact that there's a heart in us that we can make sure that if we protect that heart the whole of the body will be intact with it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells us in the Quran يَوْمَ the day لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ The day when there will be no benefit of the wealth that you come with or your children, however much they are in number, they're not going to benefit you. Yawm that day, Allah tells us, La yanfa'u mal. The money that you have will not benefit you. Wala banun, and the children that you have will not benefit you that day. The only thing that's going to benefit you, illa man atallaha biqalbin salim. Except the one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. This person is going to make it through that day. And now, since this heart is the mawdu'ul nadar, the place Allah looks at, and the place that the person's entering of Jannah, and the person's success and steadfastness is connected to it, the ulama, they gave importance to the heart then. They wrote books on it. They wrote books on it. Some of the books become volumes. The ulama, when it comes to these ayat that I mentioned, and these ahadiths, or the hadith that I mentioned of the hadith of Umar ibn Bashir, they went in details regarding it. But the best, inshaAllah ta'ala, cure and dealing of the heart that we can find is the Qur'an is sufficing. And the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu Ibn al-Qayyim says in his nuniya, وَالْكُلُّ فِي الْقُرْآنِ وَالسُّنَنِ الَّتِي جَاءَتْ عَلِ الْمَبْعُوثِ بِالْفُرْقَانِ وَاللَّهِ مَا قَالَ مْرُئٍ that the Qur'an and the Sunnah has come with that which distinguishes everything. Nobody speaks other than the Qur'an except that his speech is no value to it. Why is it that I spoke about the issue of the heart? and Why am I speaking about the matters pertaining to the heart? Because stress and grief and sorrow comes from the heart. It's where it springs from. It's the heart. The scholars, they mention that the word ham that has come in the Arabic language is of two types. The word ham that we come across and we see, it has two usages. The first of them is Hamun taqwa bihi nafs. A type of ham which strengthens. It's a stress, but this stress is positive. It's the type of stress, uh, stress which strengthens the person. It makes the person elevate. And the person attains his goals and what he's trying to achieve. The second type of ham, the second type of stress, the person's nafs becomes weak. And it prevents the person from attaining their objective and what they're trying to look for. Let's start with the one that our subject is about today, which is the type of hem that weakens the person. Because the first one, which strengthens the person, is what the scholars called, call Himma Ali, high aspirations. And we're not talking about that today. Our lecture is not regarding that. Our lecture is regarding the type of stress that weakens the person. Especially, we're going to narrow it down to the stress that a person endures when seeking knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He created us, He created us through hardship and placed us in hardship. Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ Allah says we have created, and we have certainly created man into hardship. Allah says, كَبَدْ means hardship. Allah has created you into hardship. The Mufassirin, they say, كَبَدْ here is a عَنَاءٍ وَمَشَقَّةٍ The person is brought into hardship. وَلِذَلِكَ الْإِمَامُ بْنُ مَاجَ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ He narrates in his sunan, من حديث 
معاوية بن أبي سفيان رضي الله تعالى عنه هي هذا أن الرفي صلى الله عليه وسلم السي لم يبقى من الدنيا إلا بلاء وفتنة Nothing remains in this dunya except calamities and trials and tribulations That's what remains in this world And then this world, this dar is dar ubtihan wa ibtila It's a place where you're going to go through stress It was created that way It was made that way And one of the lines of poetry that a poet said, Abil Hassan al-Tahami, rahimahullah, he said, طبعت على كدر وأنت تريدها صفوا من الأكدار والأقدار ومكلف الأيام ضد طباعها متلمس في الماء جذوة ناري This world was made through calamities and hardship and you want it pure from all of that. You want a dunya that hasn't got that hardship. When Allah made it, He made it that way. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is to distinguish it from the hereafter. But what you want is a dunya that has no hardship. Everything is easy. Everything flows. وَلِذَلِكَ بْنَ عَبَّاسِ أَوَ الْعَبَّاسِ إِبْنُ تَيْمِيَةَ Al-Harrani, he used to use, he used to say those two lines every time. So he was a person who went through a lot of hardship. So he would always read those two lines, lines of poetry. Rahimahullah ta'ala. However much, brothers, this world seems to have glitters and, and it be- is beautified to you, this dunya is always a prison for you. And as you all know, a prison cannot be a place where you enjoy. Prisons is to be stressful when you go, go inside it. As the Prophet said in the hadith, Al-Imam Muslim narrated in his Sahih, من حديث أبي هريرة, الدنيا سجن المؤمن, that this dunya is the prison of the believer, وجنة الكافر, and it's the paradise of the disbeliever. What does that mean? If everything is given to you in this world, and you've never ever gone through any hardship in this world, it's still a prison for the believer. How is it a prison for the believer? In comparison to what awaits you on the other hand, on the other side, this is this is nothing. You've been put into something pathetic compared to as a believer what awaits you on the other side. That's if you've had no stress, no hardship put your way. This dunya is still a sijin for you. It's still a prison for you. ولذلك one of the statements that amazed me was the statement of Al-Fatuh Al-Mawsili Rahimahullah He was Ahad Al-Ubbad Al-Salihin One of the righteous slaves of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala He said a very powerful statement He said Kunna qawman min ahli al-jannah He said we were a people who resided in Jannah Fasabana Iblis Iblis took us as a captive He took us as a captive in a dunya to this world he brought us of Jannah as captives and he brought us to this dunya. So there's nothing else except distress for us. We got taken out of Jannah. We've been brought to this dunya. So there's nothing for us in this dunya except stress. That's what we're going to go through. Until we're taken back to the place that we were brought out of. We're going to be distressed. We're going to go through what? Grief and sorrow. Until we are taken from the place that we were in. We were in Jannah. A place eyes have never seen, ears have never heard of, and has never come to the heart of any person. That's the place that we were in. And now we got brought to this dunya. So we have to, or we, we go through, he said, ham uh, and huzn, grief and sorrow. So this is for us to understand, brothers, that stress is going to happen regardless. And whatever I mentioned to reduce the stress of seeking knowledge is only reduction. I'm not promising you that it will take away everything. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he took the kalam of Fathul Mawsiri rahimahullah and he made it into a line of poetry. He said, فَحَيَّ عَلَى جَنَّاتِ عَدْنٍ فَإِنَّهَا مَنَازِلُكَ الْأُولَى وَفِيهَا الْمُخَيَّمُونَ لَكِنَّنَا سَبْيُ الْعَدُوِّ فَهَلْ تَرَى نُرَدُّ إِلَى مَنَازِلِنَا وَنُسَلَّمُ The same statement that Fathu al-Bawsili said, he said Ibn al-Qayyim and his Nuniyah. Also the things that will always consistently keep stress with you, the dunya is already made like that. 
So that's going to keep you stressed. And also the other thing that's going to keep you stressed, brothers, is your own nafs is made in a way, your nafs is made in a way that is meant to stress consistently. As Allah said in the Quran, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ خُلِقَ هَلُوعًا That indeed mankind was created anxious. Allah created us like that. إِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ جَزُوعًا That when evil touches him, he's impatient. وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الْخَيْرُ مَنُوعًا And when good touches him, he withholds from it. So the human's tabi'ah, the way Allah made him, it's naturally that he's going to be a stressful individual. That's what he's going to be. Also, what my lecture cannot eliminate is that shaitan also has a playing role in making a person be stressful and go through grief and sorrow consistently. Allah says to us in the Quran, إِنَّمَا ذَلِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَ Allah tells us that that this is shaytan who frightens you of his supporters. Ahl al-Tafsir, they say, يُخَوِّفُكُمْ بِأَوْلِيَائِهِ لِتَخَافُوهُمْ That Iblis uses his allies and his soldiers to place fear into your hearts. So he always wants you to be stressed. Iblis plays his role in making you stressed. Also Allah says in another ayah, الشَّيْطَانُ يَعِدُكُمُ الْفَقْرِ that shaitan threatens you with poverty. وَيَأْمُرُكُمْ بِالْفَحْشَاءِ And he orders you to do things which are immoral. He orders you immorality. Shaitan is going to say to you, are you going to seek knowledge? Really? So who's going to pay food? Who's going to pay rent and electricity? He places that in you. And every time you embark on something good, he places in front of you and threatens you with poverty. And then once you... Walk away from that which is good, then he will push you towards what? He will push you to immorality. Also, what brings about stress, brothers uh, and sisters, is that al istirsal al fil khawatir. When a person kind of lives in a fantasy world, to be honest. A lot of people don't you see that they're not living reality. And this is from the things that will, fantasy does, if you think about it too much and you dwell your mind over it, this is, becomes a haqiqah for you. And if the world doesn't become that way, you become stressed. So the person has to realize that that is also a matter. The people's hearts when it comes to stress is, we all go through it. And everybody does. But the hearts of the people are different in when it comes to stress and grief and sorrow. And the way their difference is, is in accordance to their iman. The more a person's iman is, the less stress that they go through. And the more that the person's sin is, the more stress that they go through. As Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, in details, he goes through this in his kitab, Bada'i al-Fawaid. And what we need to always remember, brothers, is there is not an illness on the face of this earth except Allah has made a cure for it. The one who knows it, knows it. And the one who is ignorant about it, is ignorant about it. But there's not an illness. Stress is an illness. There's not an illness on the face of this earth except Allah has made for it what? A cure. Alimahu man alimahu wa jahilahu man jahilahu. The one who knows it, knows it. And the one who is ignorant about it, is ignorant about it. And the ulama, the people of knowledge, they divided the cure of illnesses, whether it be stress or any other illnesses. The scholars, they categorize the cure in two types. The first one is al adwiya shariya Sharia-based cures. Cure that's taken from the kitab and the sunnah. al adwiya shariya al-mawsufatu fi khitab al the Sharia is the one that prescribed the medicine here. It's the Sharia that prescri prescribed the cure here. And the second one is Al Adwiyatul Qadariya Al Mawsufatu fi Lisan al Umam. Second type of cure is the cure that is 
prescribed through those who have specialized doctors, experience. Let's start with the first one, which is al adwiyatu al-shara'iyyati al-mawsufatu fi khitab al shara Cures that are prescribed by the sharia. I'm going to mention 15, inshallah ta'ala. For stress, specifically, because that's the mawdu that we're talking about. And it can also be applied for other than it. The first cure for stress is a tawheed wa tanzihu rabbi an dhulmi It's to come with tawheed. Sing Allah tabarak wa ta'ala in worship. Not to associate partners with him. And it is also to exalt Allah from oppression. Wa tanzihu rabb an dhulm That you get rid of and you exalt and you purify Allah from attributing any oppression to him. Number two. The second cure for stress is that the person acknowledges, the slave acknowledges that he is deficient, that he is short in the rights of his creator, that he hasn't done as it was required from him, and that he's falling short. That the slave admits willingly He's falling short in regards to the rights of his Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, Tawassul al Abd. That the slave he intercedes to his Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or he now he intercedes to his Lord through his names and his attributes. That when he wants to call his Lord out, he uses Allah's names and Allah's noble names and Characteristics that he has, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number four, Ista'anatul Abd, that the slave finds help and seeks help and refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he relies on him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he hopes from Allah wa ta'ala. Number five, the the person goes towards the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an, reads it, bitadabburin, with pondering over the verses. Number six, al-istighfar wa tawbah, the person repents and asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiveness for their shortcoming and their wrongdoings. Number seven, al-jihad, that the person fights with himself, first, foremost. That the person fights with their nafs. Number eight, as-salah, the person runs to the prayer. As the Prophet wasallam he said, وَجُعِلَتِ الصَّلَاةِ that the prayer was made qurratu aini, the warmth of my eyes. That's where I find comfort, tranquility. All of these, there's a dealer for it, but we're now going to, inshallah ta'ala, go over it fast. Number nine, al baraatu min al hawli wal quwa. That the person, he frees from himself any strength and ability. The person, he strips from himself. Any strength and ability. What do I mean by that? He admits that he has no strength, he has no ability, and that the ability and the strength and everything is in whose hand? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he increases on the statement of La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. That there's no, no one can bring this matter to this, and no one has the ability for this to happen except him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number 10. Al-Iman wa al-Amal salih The person does acts of righteous deeds, whether it be sadaqah, whether it be uh, umrah, whether, whatever it may be, come with actions which are righteous. Number 11, al-Dua. The person supplicates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number 2, the person, sorry, number 12. Number 12, the person... He comes with a dhikr, 
excessive remembrance of Allah that his mouth does not become dry from the remembrance of Allah. Number 13, جَمْعُ nafs عَلَى مَا يَنْفَعْ You busy yourself and you preoccupy yourself with that which benefits you. وَعَدَمِ التَّشَاوُلِ بِمَا فَاتَ And don't preoccupy your mind and yourself and your energy with that which has, that which has gone. Or that which has, that which does not benefit you. The Salaf, they used to say, dwelling over the past is trying to bring the dead out of their graves. Dwelling over the past, thinking too much over the past, is ikhrajil mawta min quburihim. It's trying to bring the ones who are dead out of their graves. And you're going against the sunanullah al kawniya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's universal signs. Everything goes forward, nothing goes backwards. And you are the only one that's going backwards by thinking of what already happened. So don't busy yourself with that. Busy yourself with what's in front of you and that which will benefit you. Number 14, husnul dhanni billah. Think very good of your Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Prophet said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ana inda dhanni abdi bi. I am what my slave thinks of me. In the ayah of the Qur'an, what did Allah say? ذَلِكُمْ ظَلُّكُمُ الَّذِي ظَلَنْتُمْ بِرَبِّكُمْ This is what you thought of your Lord. Allah is going to do to you what you thought of Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And last but not least, شُهُودِ الْمِنَّةِ الرَّبَّانِيَّةِ That you testify, and you admit, and you believe with unwavering conviction that the hardship and the stress and the grief that you're going through is actually a form of expiation for you. Those 15 are adwiyah shari'iyah. They are shari'i cures for stress. If a person takes, which is mentioned in the Quran and it's mentioned in the Sunnah, it will get rid of the stress that you go through. But who's going to do it? Ibn al Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he has a kitab, Mati, a great book. He called it Zadul Mi'ad fi Hadi Khayr al Ibad. I took all of that from his book. In the fourth volume, all of that I took from it last night. He has two chapters in that book of his. He's got two chapters in that book of his where he speaks about it. Now we speak about Al Adwiyat al Qadariyah. What about? The second form of medicine that a person does, which is the medicine that is prescribed by Filisad al Umam. It's being tested. The first one is that they mention is Hasmul A'mali fil Hal wa Tafarrug al Mustaqbal. Never delay what you're doing. Whatever is needed from you at that particular moment, do it. And leave your future clear. In other words, don't delay things because that's what stresses you out. When you push things backwards and then it piles up, it stresses you out and you end up doing nothing. And it's what brings about stress. In order to overcome stress, Everything that has to be done that day, do it that day. And leave your future as clear as possible or as minimal requirement that is needed from you. Number two, طَرْحُ التَّكَلُّفِ فِي أَخْذِ الفضائل. Get rid of wanting a reward for everything that you do. If a person wants to be rewarded for everything they say or do, they don't get that reward, they get stressed out. Number three, al al Choosing the best of actions. Choosing the best of actions. Number four, al nafs, training your nafs ala Allah tatrub shukra illa min Allah. To not wait for any form of gratitude from the creation. Never wanting people to show you gratitude. 
and appreciation. So you don't wait for that. Only want it from who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number five. Al-ilm having a knowledge bi anna adiyyat nas Having the knowledge that the people's harm, the people's calamity, and what the people are putting you through, whether it be be qawlin by statement, or if they say an action, la tadurruka, it will not harm you, innama tadurruhum, it harms them. So you believe that in your heart, that whatever people say about you, and whatever people do to you, that it's not going to harm you. It's actually going to harm them. How is it going to harm them? Because of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to judge, judge them for what they said about you or what they did to you. So don't take it into your mind. وَلِذَلِكَ Letting somebody or bringing somebody into your heart and thinking about them so much is letting somebody live in your heart without paying rent. This person is going to sleep. He's having a nice day. You're the only one who's thinking about it. إِذَنْ أَذِيَّةُ nas. That the people's harm that they want to put you through, whether it be speech or whether it be action, la <laughs> tadurruka, it's not gonna harm you. Okay? It's not going to harm you, rather it's gonna harm them. Number six, istihbaru qisar al hayati dunya. Bring into your mind that this dunya is very short, it's not a very long time. Everyone's gonna die very soon. It's not a very long time. The reason is because once you start thinking like that, you don't want to take a retaliation. Number seven, رِيَاضَةُ النَّفْسِ عَلَى مُعَانَاتِ مُرِّ الْقَضَاءِ وَتَعْوِيدُهَا الصَّبْرَ Training your nafs to accept the bitterness of the qadr and the qada sometimes. And training yourself upon patience. All of that seven that I mentioned, I got it from the kitab Al-Wasail Al-Mufida Fi Al-Hayati Sa'ida by Abdul Rahman Nasri Sa'di. He has a book and inshallah ta'ala we will once explain that book bi Allah al-Kareem. Number eight, Isti'amalu ma fihi sufra. Using things that are yellow. Using things that are yellow. Fa'inna sufrata because things that are bright yellow Tabsutun nafsa, it the brightness it opens the person and not dark colours. And it gets rid of depression and grief and sorrow. Abu Hayyan al Andulusi rahimahullah mentioned this in his kitab Al Bahru Muhit. And he has a, a, evidence for this, which is the statement of Allah about the cow of Banu Israel. Allah said, Safra'u a yellow cow bright in its color pleasing to the observers pleasing pleasing goes against stress so things that are yellow they bring about joy and happiness taking medication and that which your doctor prescribes for you Number 10, ityanu zawja, intimate relationship, is what gets rid of stress. If a person is stressed and they have an intimate relationship with their spouse, it gets rid of, it gets rid of stress. Many people who are young, who are youths, who are not married, the fact that the shahwa is in them brings about stress. And Abu al-Faraj ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, he spoke about this in his Majmu'ul Rasail. He made Fasl, a chapter for it, in some of his books about this issue. Number 11, Ar-Rami, archery. Archery, فَإِنَّ لَوْ أَثَرًا فِي لِهَابِ الْهَمِّ وَالْغَمْ It actually helps when it comes to stress and grief. Ibn Al-Qayyim spoke about it in very in depth and details in his Kitab, al al Muhammadiyah that archery and doing archery actually releases the tension and the stress from the person. Number 12, Lubsul Fidda, wearing silver. Ibn al Qayyim mentioned this in his kitab, Zadul Mi'ad. 
النظر في الأنوار والأزهار والأديار المليحة والألوان الحسنة Go out into the forest and see the greenery and the different types of flowers Go into a place where the wind is very nice the countryside Go into high top buildings All of these It also gets rid of stress Suyuti mentions this in his kitab Al-Shaba'il Sharifa Rahimahumullahu jami'an May Allah be pleased with all of those ulama All of these are just a summary of Benefits that I Had already So we can't go through each one in details But inshallah ta'ala In October times that, that time the stress level they say is the great greatest. Uh, we'll speak about it more in details then. But inshallah ta'ala brothers, we're going to restrict ourselves and sp- specifically speak about one type of stress. And that's the stress in seeking knowledge. There's 20 points that I promised that I would go through. But, inshallah ta'ala, today if we just do one or two, bi al-kareem, we'll leave the rest for tomorrow, bi al-kareem. The first stress that a student of knowledge will go through from those stresses is hamul ikhlas, the stress of sincerity. When a person wants to seek knowledge, they fear this concept of what? Are you showing off? Are you trying to make other people know that you're seeking knowledge? So the person starts to become, should I even seek knowledge now? Should I stop seeking knowledge? Am I a person who should learn the religion of Allah or is it for other people's hearts are clean and not for me? This is something that many go through. And the person who finds themselves enduring that and consistently asking themselves this question and always stressed like this, then remember the statement of Ibn Qayyim, وَلَا يَعْرِفُ الْرِيَاءَ إِلَّا الْمُخْلِصُونَ No one knows showing off except those who are sincere. The only person who will be scared of it and always consistently worried about showing off is a person who is sincere. It's a sign which is very good that if you're scared of showing off. If you've always got that in your mind, it's a good sign. <coughs> but what's the cure for it? Ibn Al-Qayyim mentions the fiqh, that one of the greatest fiqh, one of the greatest understanding is to understand the objectives of seeking knowledge. There's four things a person should seek knowledge for. The first reason where you're seeking knowledge for and your learning is Al-Khurujum min Al-Dalal You're learning to go outside Misguidance you don't, know, you don't want to be a misguided person You want to be a guided person So that's the first reason why you're seeking knowledge That's the first maqsad Maqsadun niyati fi talab The objectives In why you're seeking knowledge Al-Khurujum min Al-Dalal You want to go outside misguidance You don't want to be misguided Number two you want to benefit the people around you and the community that you're from and your friends that you know. You want to benefit them. That's the reason why you're out there learning and studying. And number three is ihya'ul ulum. You're trying to preserve, preserve knowledge and protect it from any what? That knowledge becoming destroyed and corrupt and forsaken. Because if the knowledge is not studied and there's not a people who are learning it, then the knowledge will what? It will just be in the books, but nobody knows it. And number three, and number four is al amalu bil ma'lumi, is to implement that knowledge which you have attained. You're learning it because you want to implement it. You want to get closer to Allah by doing it. Those four are the maqasidun niya fi talab al ilm. These are the intent of why you're seeking knowledge. And they brought it together. In three lines of poetry, فَلْتَقْصِدُ أَرْبَعَةً قَبْلَ ابْتِدَاء Before you seek knowledge, have this intention. 
تعلم لكيف تفوز بالهدى أولها الخروج من ضلال والثاني نفع خلق ذي الجلال والثالث الإحياء للعلوم والرابع العمل بالمعلوم أولها الخروج من ضلال We mentioned that The first reason you're learning it for is what? You don't want to be a misguided person والثاني نفع خلق ذي الجلال And the second is to benefit the people you're around والثالث الإحياء للعلوم And the third is to give life to this knowledge and make it, inshallah ta'ala, one that's not forgotten. وَالْرَابِعُ الْعَمَلِ بِالْمَعْلُومِ And the fourth is to implement the knowledge which you, you've learned. <coughs> Anybody who realizes that that's the objective of knowledge, and that's the intent of knowledge, then inshallah ta'ala, his intention is good if he's doing it for those four. Our pious predecessors, they used to get scared of this concept of intention. And sometimes some of them would actually embark on seeking knowledge with no intention. But they wouldn't stop seeking knowledge. Ma'amar ibn Rashid, rahimahullah, he said, كَانَ يُقَالُ إِنَّ الرَّجُلَ يَطْلُبُ الْعِلْمَ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ It used to be said that a man from amongst us, he would go and seek knowledge for other than the sake of Allah. He would do it for no good intention. فَيَأْبَى عَلَيْهِ الْعِلْمُ But then knowledge will come and refuse him. Knowledge will not let you carry on that, on that way. It will not just let you be a person who has not got a, got a good intention. As the person is learning, and the person is studying, the intention will then become good. That knowledge will refuse that until it makes it be for the sake of Allah. And Imam al Dhabi, when he brought this in his kitab, Seer Alam al Nubala, he said the following. He said, Naam, yes. يطلبه أولا والحامد له حب العلم وحب إزالة الجهل وحب الوظائف ونحو ذلك. He said, yes. He would seek and go out to seek knowledge at the beginning. And what's making him study is first of all, he loves knowledge. He loves to remove ignorance from himself. But he also wants to work. You know, he wants to get that position. He wants to be a qadi, a judge. And a qadi at that time was like a he, uh, he was a minister. He wants to get to that position. And he didn't have the knowledge of the obligation of having good intention and having truthfulness in seeking knowledge. But as the person is seeking knowledge, but if the person is seeking knowledge and they account themselves and say, look, 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 you've learned all of these misail. وَخَافَ مِنْ وَبَالِ قَصْدِهِ And then the person becomes scared of his evil intent. فَتَجِئُهُ النِّيَّةُ الصَّالِحَةِ Then the good intention will come. كُلُّهَا أَوْ بَعْضُهَا وَقَدْ يَتُوبُ مِنْ نِيَّتِهِ الْفَاسِدَةِ وَيَنْدَمُ And so the person later becomes regretful of the evil intention, the intention that they had before and then they perfect it. So it's not right for you to say I have bad intention for that reason I'm now going to stop seeking knowledge. Rather what Allah wants from you subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you what? You fight with yourself. As Allah said in the ayah in the Quran, Ya ayyuha al-ladheena amanu sbiru wa sabiru wa rabitu wa attaqu allaha la'allakum tuflihun. Allah says, O oh, those of you who believe, Asburu, preserve, I'm a persevere, that's the word I'm looking for, persevere. And then Allah says, wa sabiru, and endure, wa rabitu, and stay stationed. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ And be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ That you may be successful. Also in another ayah, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, He said, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Allah says, And those who strive for us, who work hard towards our path, we shall surely guide them to our ways. So you're fighting, you're striving. This person who is certainly striving hard, Allah says, will guide him to the straight path because he's putting so much effort in fighting with his intention. So, Fiyan al Thawriyu, he said, I did not cure and I did not have to cure something greater or more harder than my intention because one day it's for me and one day it's against me. The intention, it changes in one sit, it changes four or five times. You started off the sake of Allah, and then later it changes. And then within that sit, 
the Salaf, they used to say we would re- renew our intention every time in one sit. So it's very stressful when it comes to the concept of intention. And it gave a hard time to the Salaf. But doesn't make you stop seeking knowledge. You should carry on seeking knowledge. But you should also work on your intentions. The second, second type of stress that a student of knowledge will endure or he would go through is not being guided. I mean, the stress of feeling that you're not going to be guided on the correct way of seeking knowledge. So you keep saying to yourself, maybe I'm not taking the right path to seek knowledge. Maybe I'm not going the right way. Maybe I'm not taking the path Ibn Taymiyyah took, Ibn Al-Qayyim took, and other ulama took. So the person becomes stressed in that, in that way. Ibn Al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he said in his kitab Al-Fawaid, he said, Al-Jahl bil-Tariqi wa Afatiha, ignorance of the path and its obstacles. Pay attention to three things that he's going to mention. Ignorance of the path, number one. Wa Afatiha and the harm that path contains. Wal maqsood and the intent. Those three. Yujibu Ta'ab. It will necessitate fatigue. The person will get tired. Al Kathir. A person with excessively tired. If you're ignorant about the path, you're ignorant about the obstacles that are going to come your way when you're seeking knowledge. You don't know what was going to await you. And you don't even know maqsood, intent of why you're seeking knowledge. Because you don't remember what I just mentioned before. You don't know any of those three. What you're going to endure is what? Yujibu ta'ab al The person will endure a lot of tiredness. They'll be just tired, fatigue. Ma'al fa'idati al-qalila. And the benefit that the person leaves with is what? Very little. Five years, ten years, this person has been seeking knowledge. But because he's ignorant of the what? The path. And he's ignorant about the obstacles that would await him. Okay, there are obstacles. Knowledge has obstacles. Somebody's going to say to you, Akhi, this, are you, where, you, where do you want to go? Uh, I want to go to Birmingham, for example. They said, okay, listen. You're going to, Bir- to Birmingham. If you take that route, then the cars are going to be driving this much. And the speed that you have to drive is this much. If somebody doesn't tell you the things that you have to do, even if you know the road, but you don't know what to expect and the obstacles that could possibly be there, then you're going to definitely what? Get tired. The third, which is the maqsood, the intent. Why are you going to Birmingham for? There's not an objective of why you're going there. You're also going to be tired. These three, knowing the path, knowing the obstacles that can come your way and knowing the intent of why you're taking this path in the first place. What are you trying to achieve from this? Those three, if you have them, you will not feel as tired as many people are. And you will leave with a lot of benefit. And it's because of these three, many people are tired. Now brothers, what's the cure here then? The cure is, for this, is Irshadul Arifin. The cure for this is that you have to be guided by those who know. Somebody who knows the path, he knows the obstacles of that path. He also knows the intent that you need to come with. Okay? If you get that person, a shaykh, a person of knowledge, a person who's, who knew that path, who just took it, he comes back and he tells you, this is the route, this is the road, this is the corner, this is the turn. He gives you the insight. He will save you a lot of time. You'll be less tired. And you'll come up with a lot of benefits. Because he's going to give you back, back routes. He's going to say to you, I was stuck in traffic jam. You know what? Don't take the route. Take another route. It's going to save you from it. وَلِذَلِكَ the famous hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu in which he taught us that this religion is taken from one shaykh to another shaykh to another shaykh to another shaykh. The Prophet said in the hadith, تَسْمَعُونَ وَيُسْمَعُ مِنْكُمْ وَيُسْمَعُ مِمَّنْ سَمِعَ مِنْكُمْ Abdullah ibn Abbas narrated in the hadith, في سنة أبي داود بالسند قوي عبد الله بن عباس narrated from the Prophet and the hadith is found in سنة أبي داود the Prophet said تسمعون you guys will hear from me نبي الله محمد you hear from me ويسمع منكم and there are going to be people going to listen to you guys and take knowledge from you guys ويسمع ممن سمع منكم and those who heard from you will also be heard from which is the tabi'in so this is what? from the Prophet the companions the scholars, students of the companions of the tabi'in, and then the tabi'u tabi'in. 
And the qa'idah is وَالْعِبْرَةُ بِعُمُومِ الْخِطَابِ لَا بِخُصُوصِ الْمُخَاطَبِينَ Even though the Prophet is talking to the companions here, it's not restricted to them as alone. This is till the day of judgment. That this knowledge will be taken jeel after jeel. ولذلك الإمام أبو إسحاق الشاطبي in his kitab al-muwafaqat in the muqaddima, in the muqaddima he talks about this issue of the ways to attain knowledge, the path of seeking knowledge. I advise you guys to try to inshaAllah ta'ala read that. But bi'ithni Allah al we will, we will, we will bring his complete statement inshaAllah ta'ala there. A poet said, a poet said, rahimahullah once, وَمَنْ رَامَ الْعُلُومَ بِغَيْرِ شَيْخٍ يَضِلُّ عَنِ الصِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ وَتَلْتَبِسُ الْعُلُومُ حَتَّى يَكُونَ أَضَلَّ مِنْ تَوْمَ الْحَكِيمِ تَصَدَّقَ بِالْبَنَاتِ عَلَى رِجَالٍ يُرِيدُ بِذَاكَ جَنَّاتِ النَّعِيمِ The poet he said, وَمَنْ رَامَ الْعُلُومَ بِغَيْرِ شَيْخٍ Anyone who wants to attain knowledge without a teacher يَضِلُّ عَنِ الصِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ This person will become misguided from the straight path. وَتَلْتَبِسُ الْعُلُومُ The knowledge will become mixed up. It's all over the place for him. Because he doesn't know the path. وَتَلْتَبِسُ الْأُمُورُ أَمْ وَتَلْتَبِسُ الْعُلُومُ Then sciences and everything will become mixed up for him. He'll get mixed up and muddled up. وَتَلْتَبِسُ الْعُلُومُ عَلَيْهِ حَتَّى يَكُونَ أَضَلَّ مِنْ تَوْمَ الْحَكِيمِ Until he becomes more misguided than the man Tawm al-Hakim. He'll be more misguided than this man Tawm al-Hakim. Who's Tawm al-Hakim? تَصَدَّقَ بِالْبَنَاتِ عَلَى رِجَالٍ What he did was this man, he thought he would get closer to Allah by marry, by giving women a sadaqah. You give money a sadaqah, right? Somebody sadaqah. So what he was doing was, he would give out he, his daughters to men for sadaqah, trying to get to what? تَصَدَّقَ بِالْبَنَاتِ عَلَى رِجَالٍ يُرِيدُ بِذَاكَ جَنَّاتِ النَّعِيمِ He's trying to get Jannah through it. هذا جهل مرحب. Are we all together? So, because he didn't take this knowledge from a shaykh, and he didn't learn from a shaykh, a person of knowledge. So the way that you can save yourself, or the way that you can get rid of this stress that you might have, which is being guided to the way to seek knowledge, is that you take that knowledge from a person who has knowledge, who can guide you and say, this is this science, and this is what it's about, and give you an understanding, and give you what books to read, and what books to stay away from. When they say that to you, is because they learned a lot. They know where the mistakes happened for them. They're going to save you a lot of time. That ta'ab and that tiredness that he went through, you won't go through, inshaAllah ta'ala. And, and what's also going to happen, is that you're going to leave with more fa'ida. So imagine if I spent 10 years confused, I started, should I go to this book? No, it's not beneficial for me. That 10 years I wasted. I could save you that 10 years, right? Can I not? I could save you that 10 years, which I was confused, methylen, in order for you to not take that path that I took. So you would come out with 10 years quicker than, every, than, than, than me. So you're less tired then. And you're also going to come up with more benefit. Because that 10 years, you're going to do what's more beneficial for you. So you're going to elevate and grow faster. Inshallah ta'ala will stop there bi kareem Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and shaitan and Allah and his messenger are free from it. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfirullah wa atubu